we hope it's working. Time will tell. Um, just wanted to make a couple of announcements here. On Saturday the 18th, we are having a bagels and birds walk on the Whistle Stop Trail. We'll have coffee and a little bit of uh, refreshment to get you energized. It's being led by our very own Nick Ledley. And uh, we hope you can all come out and enjoy it. Um, from what I've read, we should be right kind of in the middle of the warbler migration where the couple of early species may have come and gone, but a lot of others should be moving through and where it's been cool I think um, that may in fact be the case and there may be a fair amount to see and where it's been cool, the leaves have not really come out yet, which is helpful. So that's eight o'clock on Saturday, the 18th. Um, we've been working on next fall and in September, we're gonna have um, Nick Lund come up from Maine Audubon and give us all sorts of information about the latest legislative things that they're working on. And believe me, there's a lot. In uh, October, Herb Wilson is going to come back and talk about what he tells me is his favorite subject, which is vagrant birds and why the whys and wherefores of that. And then in November, um, one of the professors from the university here, along with a research associate, are going to be talking about high altitude lakes and how they're kind of like as I understand it, the canary and the cold mine, they're an indicator of what's going on. And they've been doing some interesting research for several year now, years now. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what's coming in the fall. All right, and again, thank you for your patience. I keep getting emails from people trying to see our recordings and I think hopefully we're getting there with all of that. So tonight we all have Ron Joseph. I think a lot of you know him. He has spent a lifetime devoted to wildlife and conservation and has been um, since childhood, I gather, observing and enjoying the world around us. And so I am not gonna take up any more of his time and hopefully all of this IT stuff will keep going. So thank, enjoy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Bert. Um, and thanks for dinner, by the way. I think we can dim a few lights. Yeah, that's what, not all, but How's that? How's that? Yeah, a little better? Okay. Um, yeah, this is kind of dizzying. <laughs> Microphones attached to me and camera angles, different angles, but I can roll with it. I'm I'm adaptable. Um great to be back. I think I think this is at least the third presentation I've done for Maine, a Western Maine Audubon over the years, and uh, happy to be here. And as some of you are, are aware, um, I got talked into publishing a book last year uh, from my good friend Paul Dwarren, who who's very popular in the state of Maine as a writer. Um, in his, his series, maybe some of you have read them. Um, but Paul and I have done a couple of uh, book events together. This one was in Freeport. We did one in Camden. And Paul and I have been friends for many, many years. And he and his wife actually uh, talked me into writing the book during my during the pandemic. Um, but tonight, rather than talk about my book, because some of you have been to my presentation in Farmington in November, and I did, that was specifically about the book. But tonight, I'd talk more about my career as a wildlife biologist. Some of the species I cover tonight are mentioned in the book, moose especially, others are not. But uh, I've been busy. I've had, uh, I think, I think uh, the book came out in May of 2023 and uh, I'm over 50 book stops already. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't plan it this way, but I'll be in Bar Harbor tomorrow night at the library in Bar Harbor. Um, and I've got eight, eight more scheduled and then I think I'm gonna call it, I think I'm gonna call it, uh, call it good after that. But this is my hometown, Oakland, Maine, where I was born and raised, and uh, they had me there in February. Um, yes, as Nancy said in the beginning, um, I've been surrounded by wildlife since I was a kid, and this is my grandparents' dairy farm in Mercer, which isn't very far from here. It's just on the other side of New Sharon. They had a dairy farm for many, many years. They moved in in 1917. It was my grandfather's farm. And as kids, 
my twin brother and I, we were born in 1952. We just wanted to spend every waking hour on the farm. Um, who wouldn't? I mean, they had, they had dairy cows and they had sheep and and um, uh, workhorses, chickens. Uh, I loved it. This picture was taken in 1972 when my parents bought the farm from my grandparents and they put up a new barn. So that's why the you don't see the old post and bean barn because this is I took the photograph really to get a picture of the new barn, not not so much uh, not so much the, the buildings itself. But my grandparents, you know, we can look back on our lives and say, you know, what people really influenced us. And by far, it was my grandmother and grandfather. And I love this story because this photograph, because it really, it captures the personality of both of them. My grandfather was pretty easygoing. Uh, my grandmother was a little uptight. My grand grandfather, he's holding a glass of beer. And in her left arm, she's hiding the bottle from the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was, she didn't approve of alcohol. Uh, that's me in the Adirondack chair way in the back with my, she's holding my twin brother, Don. That was taken in 1953. Um, like I said, we just, and with my cousins and my, my other brother, um, just love spending time with my grandparents. Just absolutely loved it. And especially, his, he always had a team of workhorses. So, and there was a pet skunk. The neighbors had a pet skunk. It was descented. Uh, there's a farm next to theirs, and a family of skunks got hit by a car, and the smell was overpowering. And um, uh, so they went up to investigate, and there was one little, one tiny little kit that was survived. The others were all killed, and they they had, they raised it, and it would spend as much time on our farm as it did the neighboring farm. So that was my first really big introduction to to wildlife. But my mother, I was saying at dinner time, my mother was a uh, uh, what we call a backyard birder. She didn't travel places to see birds. We didn't have a lot of money, um, but she had a love of birds and it was infectious. And I can remember her holding me up as a kid by my waist and looking out the, the front window at, at uh, all these birds were coming to the feeder. You want to see this? She could see that I had this interest in birds. So she tried to fo foster it. And I remember she bought That's me nice a Peterson Field Guide, stuff. 1947 edition at a yard sale for 50 cents and she picked up these opera glasses wow. <laughs> for 25 cents because we couldn't afford binoculars but my twin brother and i would fight running around the farm who could use the who could use the opera glasses until we both figured out we could see the birds better without the opera glasses but the first bird i can remember being really struck by was this magnolia warbler it was in the it was in the flowering um um, lilacs in the cemetery, old cemetery across the road. And we raced back to the farmhouse. We we're just maybe five, six years old and opened up the book and we couldn't find this bird. And my mother and my grandmother sat down at the kitchen table with us and figured out that it was a magnolia warbler. And it was just absolutely stunning. And if you ever seen one, they are. They're absolutely gorgeous. That's me and the uh, right here with a cowboy shirt <laughs> my christmas time and i'm holding um my blue ribbon bird nest collection <laughs> as just a kid that gives you an idea how, how much i was really interested in birds and then i took that love of birds and went on to college and uh got a degree at the university of new hampshire in 1974 and I almost flunked out of college. I came really close to flunking out. And if I had not taken ornithology, the study of birds, my second semester sophomore year, I, I would have, I definitely would have flunked out. I was really more interested in partying than I was anything else. But I took this class, Dr. Bora, and it's true. One person can make a big difference in your life. And he, he turned my life around. And he gave me an A in a class. And he made me his instructor, his lab instructor, which was really high praise given that those positions are usually held for, for graduate students. But I'm showing you this photograph taken in 1980 of me banding golden eagles in Utah, because I got my master's degree in Utah. And the bird closest to me was banded in 1980 by, by me and my assistant, Kent Keller. And it was killed in 2012. And I took this record from... 
It's all about birds. If you go to all about birds and you look up that website, Cornell University website, it's a fabulous website. And you scroll down, you hit, click on Golden Eagle and scroll down. You'll see this note. The oldest recorded Golden Eagle was 31 years, and that's her right here. She was hit by a car uh, in 2000. But she's the oldest known uh, Golden Eagle, in at least in North America. I think there's one maybe a few months older in, uh, in Europe, but not by much. But it was really cool to get that record from the bird banding laboratory after all those years. So that's how I got my start, was setting eagles out west. And you know, did my work in Utah, uh, bald eagles and golden eagles. And, and they're just stunning, just absolutely stunning birds. Um, I've been back, I went back last year for the first time in 40 years to the old uh, places that we banded birds. And then I also worked on peregrines out west and, and got to visit all the national parks in Utah, Zion. Capitol Reef, Canyonlands, um, Bryce, um, Glen Canyon National Park, doing peregrine surveys. This is an, and I can remember pinching myself in the late seventies and early eighties, thinking I'm getting paid to do this, to do these peregrine surveys. And then I came back to Maine and got involved with the peregrine reintroduction program here. Um, it was by 1962, all the peregrines east of the Mississippi were extirpated. I mean, they were wiped out by DDT. The only surviving peregrines were in the West, and there weren't very many. It was they were they were impacted by DDT too, but to a lesser extent, but not by much. They had a little remnant population of birds. We had none. So in order to get peregrines back into Maine, now we've got forty pairs. They were what's called hack. This is a hack box. It's an old technique that falconers used to train birds for flying, and it would take these. Little birds, young young birds right here, produced at Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They had what's called the hawk barn. And they had these peregrines that they asked all these falconers to loan to Cornell for a period of time to get them to breed in captivity. And then their progeny was shipped out to states like Maine. And these youngsters were put in these boxes without any parents. And they were fed through a chute. You can see the chute on the left by humans. We didn't want them to think, they didn't want them to associate people with food. So they were fed Quaternix quail, and then they fledged. And now we've got those birds, since we began in 1988, though we now have like 40 pairs of peregrines, including one, I don't know if you've ever been to Sea Pond, which is not very far from here. Um, it's got a really uh, steep cliff, and there's a, there, there was a pair of peregrines there. And I can remember in the early 90s rappelling down to that nest site and being buzzed by the adults. They don't like it. <laughs> yeah, they, they are really, really aggressive um, peregrines are around the nest. Golden eagles, bald eagles, the adults take off, but not peregrines. And I can remember being struck in the back of my head over at uh, Sea Pond. And uh, have you ever been to Sea Pond? Anybody ever been to Sea Pond? It's a pretty impressive cliff. Uh, just west of here, over near New Hampshire border. But it's a very, very big cliff. And I had 150 foot per one rope, climbing rope, which is adequate enough for getting into golden eagle nests, but not peregrine nests. Peregrines like really big cliffs, escarpments, like uh, Mount Kineo has another place where the peregrines are nesting on Moosehead Lake. But 150 feet of rope isn't enough to reach the bottom. So you got to come back up, which I had these Jumar ascenders and uh, they, they work one way and you climb back up the rope. And all the time I'm coming back up because I wanted to collect these prey items in the nest because we wanted to figure out what they were eating. And, and then we could do some analysis on the food they were eating, if they were contaminated or not. And all the while, the, the young had already fledged, but the adults were still, were still being really aggressive and, and dive bombing me. And, uh, I can remember just, I got up and I didn't realize I'd been hit. I got a, they raked me across the back of the neck with a talon and I was I had a little bit of bleeding going on. So I just, but yeah, they're, and they're screaming all the time. Just, <laughs> and then they can fly 100, 150, 160 miles an hour and just coming in and uh, hitting me. 
several times, but I got all these feathers out of the nest. And I remember they were eating, we had them analyzed in, 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 uh, at the Smithsonian Institute in, in DC. And most more, a lot of more red-breasted grosbeaks, a rose-breasted grosbeaks, excuse me, summer uh, scarlet tanager, morning dove. I think there was a teal in there too, but they're, they used to be called duck hawks, but yeah, look at that. I always, this is coming right in. <laughs> But they are a great bird. They just really are. Um, their name, Falco peregrinus, means wandering falcon. Um, and they do. They, they travel. The birds that nest in Alaska, way up on the Colville River, they, they migrate all the way down to the southern tip of South America. Uh, we've had some of our peregrines that were hacked here. Um, did you read the latest issue of Habitat magazine? The Maine Audubon Habitat magazine. I got a story in there about this program, and that one of the peregrines that we hacked at Borestone Mountain over near Moosehead. She survived. She was a youngster, and she fledged. As an adult, she showed up in Boston. She decided she wanted to live in the city, <laughs> and not <laughs> the Maine woods, and she killed the adult peregrine at the on the customs building. And took over. And the Boston Globe had this big headline that coup at the coop. <laughs> like a mafia style hit. She just went in and knocked off the female and then bred with the male and raised her own young. So not all of our birds end up staying Maine. They end up they end up taking off other places. Um, Maine's a great state. I mean, I I went out west for quite a few years, loved it, but being a Maine kid, I miss the woods and I miss the green and I miss the water. And I can remember in 78, I got out of graduate school, came back to Maine. My wife had a job in Lewiston at Bates College. We had an apartment. We had no money. It was 78. We just, you know, we just got out of grad school. And uh, I had an apartment in downtown. I'm thinking, this is no life for wildlife. Wow. Just so there was a temporary job being offered at in Augusta. Uh, out of Augusta, you, uh, uh, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So I applied. This is December 1977. So I go up and I interview for the job. And of course, Christmas is coming up, so they don't make any decision until January. So they call they call the uh, four or five of us that were screened to get interviewed further up. And I went up and I was third on the list. They had picked two other guys for the position and they were told, these two other guys, that the job was in Ashland. Well, look where Ashland is. <laughs> Ashland. So they had a big map in the conference room of Maine Fish and Wildlife in Augusta. And they said, well, where's the job? These two guys, and they said, it's in Ashland. They said, well, we're not going up there. I'm waving my hand. I'll go there. <laughs> I mean, you got to take your, you got to take advantage of your opportunities. So I, I jumped on it and I was sent to this place, Clayton Lake. Uh, it's a, uh, Clayton Lake, if I can go back, let's see here. Clayton Lake, if you can see Ashland, go west to the Allagash. And on the other side of the Allagash, basically where the S is on the mountains, just a little bit west of there. That's that's Clayton Lake, 65 miles west of Ashland. It was closer to drive through the woods in 78 to go to St. Palmfield and St. Oralee. And it was to get to Ashland. But so that's where I ended up. That's where this place is. And I was, it was a mostly French Canadian lumberjacks, right? Operated by uh, Bill Sylvester. He was the supervisor. He was, he's from Auburn. And they had uh, a couple of American foresters there. But in the main cabin, uh, mostly all French Canadians. And I, and I, the bunk room was upstairs. And I stayed in the bunk room with the, so I had a wonderful winter with the French Canadian woodcutters. And I can remember my job was to study deer yards. And I would spend five or 10 miles a day on snowshoes from January through early April, every day, five to 10 miles on snowshoes. I never had a cold all winter. I, I loved it. I mean, it was, uh, and when April came, uh, the snows melted, 
and I didn't want to leave because it was it was it was a wonderful community, Clayton Lake, just absolutely wonderful. The people were great. And then years later, I read this story. You know, if I'm going to give you an assignment, <laughs> look up north of the CP line. It's an article. It's in the New Yorker, and it's written by John McPhee. If you read any of his books, Coming into the Country, uh, he's a great writer. You know, he's he's written many many bestsellers. And he wrote a story about his namesake, John Jack McPhee, who was a game warden who patrolled by plane. He was a main warden pilot. He patrolled the district north of the Canadian Pacific line. So that's hence the title, North of the CP line. So it's a beautiful story about his week with the, this game warden that I knew very well, uh, John Jack McPhee. Jack was a uh, warden pilot stationed on Eagle Lake, north of, uh, of Portage. And I would call him on a radio phone at Clayton Lake, and he would come in and land on his, in the wintertime on his skis, uh, his Cessna, pick me up, and we'd fly over the Big Black River, for example. And I would look at the deer yard from, from maybe a thousand feet up and, and map it on the, uh, make the etches on the topo sheet. Uh, it was, he was great. Jack died around 2003 in a plane crash, but wonderful guy. And this story, north of the CP line, um, it's a beautiful piece written about the main game warden. Um, Bird asked me if I could talk a little bit tonight about climate change, winners and losers. And uh, one of the Joys, I had a chance to work on the Canada Lynx project um, back in 1999 when it first started. It was a 10 year project. And uh, this me holding a kitten in Township 12, Range 12. And we didn't know very much about lynx back then. And we know a lot more about them now. But I say they're a climate change loser because if you look at this animal, the adult, you just notice the hind feet. They have really, really big feet, and they don't weigh very much. This animal probably weighs 28 pounds, 30 pounds. They're all fur, but they have these really big feet. They act like snowshoes, and their primary prey is snowshoe hare. So they sort of like co-evolved, if you will, with snowshoe hare. Snowshoe hare can run on top of the snow. So can lynx. They don't sink very much. But the snowpack is changing in the North Main woods. We get heavy snows where the links are, and we get rain events, the snow settles, and then we get these freezing temperatures, so it gets crusty. And that's a really distinct disadvantage for Canada lynx, because they, they have a, there's a lot of predators in the North Main woods that compete with them for snowshoe hare, uh, bobcats, coyotes, fisher, but they struggle through deep snow. Lynx do not. So this changing snowpack is going to have a big impact on Canada lynx. Here's another animal that winners and loses about climate change. I took this in my backyard a couple of years ago, uh, December 6, 2022, a gray fox. I mean, didn't have gray foxes when I was a kid in Maine. Um, so they're moving north. So my point is, a lot of more southerly mammals, possums, never had possums. Now you can find roadkill possums. I don't know if you've seen them up this far yet, but but if you ever stop and look at a roadkill possum, pull over to the side of the road, being a biologist, I'm always curious. So I get out and look. And if you, I'd be curious if you look at one closely, you might find that some of the fingers, the digits and the toes are gone because they have frostbite. They're not well adapted to our winters. Um, so almost nearly, probably nine out of the 10 ones that I've looked at road kills are missing fingers because of, um, the, the, or toes because of frostbite. But have you seen gray fox here? Anybody seen gray fox up this way? Um, climate change winner, bobcat, for the reasons I just mentioned, um, because as the climate warms, as Maine gets warmer, our winters are getting shorter. 
and deer are starting to really proliferate, they're going to move further north. They've been, deer are relatively short-lived. They have to have deer yards or deer wintering cover, uh, mature stands of spruce and fir to spend the winter in because A, the snow is less deep in those stands and the winds are less severe and nighttime temperatures are actually warmer because uh, of the blanket effect. But uh, warmer winters is going to make that less important because they're going to be, be able to move around more freely. And bobcats feed predominantly in the wintertime uh, on, on deer. Um, I've seen a couple of, found a bobcat a couple times uh, up in a big tree cedar, northern white cedar, and there's a dead deer buried in the snow nearby. Um, they, it's kind of gruesome how they kill them, but I mean, they got to live too. So um, and they jump on the back of the deer and they grab them right by the, by the uh, um, windpipe with their jaws, try and just hang on until they suffocate, the deer suffocates. But then, because the snow's deep and it's hard work for them to get a deer, they camp out right above the, right above the deer or near the deer and cover it and bury it up. So I think as um, the snowpack changes, bobcats are going to, and they, where, where the two occur, bobcats and lynx, lynx usually are dispersed by, by bobcats. Beautiful animal, but when you think about it, bobcats occur from Florida, Arizona, all the way up to Maine. So the warm weather isn't going to affect them as much as it does the lynx. Um, Cape May warbler um, was one of the things I was able to do up at Clayton Lake to so go back later in June and do BBS routes. Those are breeding bird surveys. They're 25 miles long. Anybody do BBS routes in here? They're 25 miles long. There's a stop every half mile and you, you listen for three minutes, record everything you see in here. And because Clayton Lake is right in the heart of the Maine's boreal forest, that's where you get the boreal forest birds like Cape May warblers. Um, this is a bird is a spruce, bird, spruce budworm specialist, meaning when there's a budworm outbreak, they will raise, sometimes, some, some, some pairs will raise two broods a year. But the boreal forest is going to be impacted by a warming climate. So any species that needs spruce fir forest, um, they're going to be, they're going to be, impacted by it. And then I did point count surveys. Those are a little more intense uh, surveys. They're only a couple hundred meters apart. I did those on the stud mill road that runs basically from Milford near Old Town through the woods through Callis. I did a bunch of those there. So I, I was pretty good with my hearing from 1990 to 2010. And we're talking at dinner time. That's where I really learned how to identify birds by song because um, it comes out you fast and furious when you're jotting down what you're hearing and seeing. But Cape May warblers were pretty common up in the big woods when uh, when I was doing these surveys up in up in northern Maine. But they're going to be a loser because uh, the boreal forest is going to is going to start moving northward to the mountaintops in Maine where they already exist, but also further north. So we're going to have more southerly trees coming in. This is this is over a period of time. And I don't know if you saw the piece I had in that. I've, I've been asked to write a column in the um, the Scott Monroe, the managing editor of the Central Maine papers, newspapers, asked me to write a monthly outdoor column. And my recent one was about moose and uh, how they're going to be a climate change loser because as the winters get shorter, winter tick populations are going to get bigger. And they've always been impacted to some extent by winter ticks, but not to the extent that they are now. I mean, some of these animals today, uh, some of these moose, they have 50,000 to 90,000 ticks on them. And and it, the candle's burning at both ends for the moose because as the falls are shorter, or excuse me, longer, uh, I can't remember hunting, as I mentioned in the newspaper, I can remember hunting in a t-shirt in November in Holton and coming through this old potato field with red osier dogwood when I got to my vehicle, my red uh, hunter 
uh, vest was just covered with winter tick larvae, tiny ones, hundreds of them all over me. Well, imagine those are all getting on, on these moose. Uh, but if it was cold, they wouldn't be able to, but it's warmer. So the survival rate for these larvae to get on attached to moose has increased. So we're seeing, you know, some, like I said, some of these moose are carrying hundreds, tens of thousands of ticks on them. Um, and the other issue is winters are shorter and, and the, at, the, at the other end, springs come earlier. And when these ticks drop off in April, if they land on snow, their survival rate decreases because the birds are jays, blue jays, and Canada jays will eat them. Plus, they'll die of exposure. But if we don't have any snows in April and those ticks, those pregnant female ticks land, they, each, they, they can lay up to 4,000 eggs in one, one tick. Um, they land on leaf litter, then their survival rate increases. So this is a this is a really this is a big issue. This is a really big issue. And there's a poor cow, you know, with uh you look real closely on the rear end, you know, they just they rub themselves to try to get these ticks off. Um and you get a moose this size with say fifty thousand to hundred uh, ninety thousand ticks on it, she'll lose thirteen gallons of blood. Uh, over the course of the winter. She can't manufacture blood fast enough to replace the blood loss. So if she raises any young, some of those young are going to be um, underweight or she'll abort the fetus or she'll die herself. And it's not every year. Some years we've had you know high moose calf mortality. A few years ago, like 90% of the moose in the study, calves in the study area died. But in recent years, I've been told that that it's 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 improving. So it's not it's not a linear line straight up. So it's going to have, but but it's kind of like this. So over the long run, but that this picture was taken in Aroostook County by Paul Sear. He's a great photographer, a friend of mine. And if you can you can see you can still see some of the ticks on on this poor moose. Um, Wildlife watching is a big driver of Maine's multi-million dollar tourism industry. Uh, Maine Audubon did a study quite a few years ago about what are the impacts of wildlife watching have on Maine, and it's it's in the it's in the millions. And the number one question that people ask me during my career is, where can I see a moose? People want to see a moose, and so it's not just the moose that are going to suffer from climate change. It's going to be all these little industries that cater to moose watching. You know, Greenville, there's a lot of guides there. I worked with a guide up in the uh, up in um, uh, Flagstaff area for 20 years to just go see moose. This picture was taken at Sandy Stream Pond. I mean, it a, that's one of the famous places in Maine to go photograph moose. And look at the people standing there. They all want wait, wait to wait to see a moose, a bull moose. Um, this is Greg Drummond. I don't know if some of you know Greg. Greg ran Claybrook Mountain Lodge, which is not too far from here. Greg and I went to high school together, and he and I called moose for 20 years, uh, 1999 to 2019. And uh, we had great fun, a lot of fun, seeing because it's a thrill to see somebody see a moose for the first time. But it was just, it was just great fun. We called this moose, and... This bull showed up, <laughs> like flowers in his hair. <laughs> but, but he imitated a cow, and this cow, this this bull moose came really during the rut, came charging up out of the bushes, like, oh wait a minute, you're not a cow. And it turned and and went back into the woods. But it was so fun to hear the cameras clicking behind us. I mean, we've guided for moose hunters too. Not that I'm, I'm not opposed to it. Still not opposed to hunting, but um, point is, there's a lot of people who want to just want to see a moose and get a photograph of it too. So I think the state's in a you know pretty good balancing act right now, trying to figure out how we're going to have moose to, for people to see and then have moose for people to hunt. And I think they've done a pretty good job. Uh, I have to give them good good marks. Um, well, I put this picture in because one of the oddest jobs I ever had. I was in Greenville working for Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, 88 to 90. 
and Commissioner Bill Vale, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, called me up. And the commissioner never called the regional biologist directly. But he called me up. He says, Ron, I got, I got a request. I said, what's that, Bill? He says, uh, you know, there's a lot of moose getting hit by cars on Route 201 from Jackman to the Forks. I said, yeah, I've been, I've been following that pretty closely. He says, well, as a legislature, he says, I'm not going to tell you his name, but there's a legislature in Somerset County. He wants to do something about it. I said, well, what's he want to do? He says, he bought barrels and barrels of concentrated wolf urine, and he wants you to spray it on Route 201. I said, Bill, this is this is a joke, right? He says, no, no, it's, I'm serious. I said, Bill, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. He says, you know it's not gonna work. I know it's not gonna work, but we this is an influential legislation. We don't want to tick him off. And he's already bought this concentrated wolf, wolf urine from Minnesota. There's a there's a wolf rehabilitation center in Ely, Minnesota. You've heard of it, right? And believe it or not, they collect the urine uh, from these moose and they sell it. And because it's kind of it's supposedly when you smell it, the the game like flees. And, and so for a week, I'm in a DOT <laughs> spray truck with a hazmat soup going up and down Route 201 from from Jackman to the forks, spraying the roadside ditches with this concentrated wolf urine. And it's just. And then, of course, I knew. I said, Bill, if it rains, it's going to wipe it out. And sure enough, the next week it rained the whole week. So it had it had no effect. But at least the legislature could, legislator could say to his constituents, I tried to do something about it. And, but it is a serious problem. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not quibbling with the fact that you got a moose on a road on a foggy day or foggy night. That's that's dangerous. But Spraying the roadside isn't isn't the answer. Back then, let's see, that was the late eighties, early nineties. The moose population was probably as high then as it's ever been in the state of Maine. It came right on the heels of all this clear cutting that we had post budworm epidemic, and you know, when they had all these salvage cuts, that was pretty controversial. But after all these salvage clear cuts, you know the. Growth came. You can't keep a tree from growing in Maine. So the trees started to grow back. All these hardwood saplings. Ideal food for moose. Just wonderful moose habitat. So these moose, they're no dummies. They moved into these regenerating clear cuts, started feeding. All this food, wasn't, no surprise you see moose calves, uh, moose cows with twins and with triplets. Huh. So the moose population skyrocketed. And it was, you know, all along Route 201, there's all these, especially north of the forks, all these clear cuts. So it isn't surprising that, you know, you end up with these moose wandering across these roads and getting hit by cars. But uh, I throw this in because I had a chance to get involved. This is in probably late 90s, early 2000 uh, with the Biodiversity Research Institute in, in Portland, looking at mercury levels in and loons and we would go out at night and well, I'd go out during the day find these loon pairs with chicks and then uh, wait for nightfall and then go out in the boat at night for the spotlight and separate the chick from the adults and catch these adult loons because all you got to do is imitate a, a chick in distress with a and they come right swim right towards the boat <laughs> just like a chick and we had a boston whaler big boat and they would swim they'd swim right up to the boat and just pull out and then we had a vet veterinarian from tufts that would monitor everything take blood samples and then we release the birds in some cases the birds were the adults were so hot you can tell by their because they shed heat the adults through their feet no feathers on the feet so that's right if they can tell just monitoring the temperature and sometimes they just say she's too hot put her back in the water you know, we didn't even get the blood sample but some of our loons have really high mercury levels and it's coming from atmospheric deposition but that was a really that was a great project that really was we we collected loons captured loons from 
Aziska Haas, Rangeley, um, Umbagog, um, Spencer Lake, Austin Pond, up through Bingham and that area. So it was it was a multi year project, but it was it was it was a lot of fun. And tell you what, driving around at night in a car <laughs> with a truck. Going from pond to pond, you get a little sleepy, and then and you these moose run out in front of you, and that'll wake you up. And you know, I had a great chance to. Uh, I was in Greenville, especially to work with the Bear Project. Um, and there's stories in my book. If you don't have my book, um, I brought some copies here tonight. But there's some chapters in there about my work with the Bear Study Team, uh, Randy Cross. Um, I can remember. I think it was 19, spring of 1989, I'm in my office and this woman drove a pickup truck into the Greenville office, which is, which is right at the south end of Moosehead Lake. And my, my office was right, was right there and I could look out the window and I could see her walking across the parking lot. This is probably, I wanna say early March, and she's got a blanket. She's got this thing, something wrapped up in a blanket. And she comes in and she just burst into tears. Um, she has a cub, a bear cub. Her husband was a logger up at Rockwood. And uh, he didn't know. He backed a skitter up over what he thought was a brush pile. And it was a bear's den. And, you know, skitter probably weighs... I don't know, 15,000, 18,000 pounds. Maybe somebody here knows better than me, but they weigh a lot, skitter. And it, and a sow is not going to leave her cubs in the den. So it crushed the den, killed her and one of her cubs. And then he shut the engine off and went home and came back the next day to start the skitter. And he could hear a baby crying. They sound just like a baby when they're bawling. That's strange. So he got rummaging around through the brush pile and he found this cub that was still alive, barely. Call, this is before cell phones. He drove out to Rockwood, called his wife. She came up in a pickup truck, grabbed the, grabbed the cub and brought it to my office. And I didn't know what to do with it. Um, so I called Martin French. There's a story in the book about Martin and Ruth French. They were retired dairy farmers in Dover Foxcroft. Amazing couple. They're both dead now. Um, but they had no kids, so they had all these, this barn with these cow stalls, and they repurposed the barn into a wildlife rehabilitation center. And he was really known for caring for bear cubs, orphan bear cubs. So I called Martin up. Martin says, bring her down, Ron. So I brought I'm driving down through Dover Foxcroft, and I got this little cub. I didn't even think it was going to live um, in a little box in the front seat of my state truck with fish and wildlife on the side. And I think there's only one light in Dover Foxcroft. So I'm pulling up to the light in Dover Foxcroft because he's south of town. And a school bus pulls up beside me. And the next thing I know, I hear all these kids in the school bus screaming. And this little cub unbeknownst to me, he had stuck his head out of the box and he started to climb up the window. And he's just looking and the school bus is right here and I'm right here. And the kids are yelling and pointing at each other. And I said, so I was, oh, so I just tapped him on the nose and he went back into the box. The bus went off and I, I went down to Martin's and Martin says, oh, these buggers are tough. He says, I, I, you'd be surprised, Ron. He says, I've had a couple of these cubs that were in rough shape. He says, give me, give me some time. So week goes by and I call Martin up. I said, Martin, what, how's that cub doing? Oh, good. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's gaining weight. Uh, not a lot, but gaining weight. Stronger. No more. He's not losing his hair anymore. He was losing his hair. Poor thing. Well, another week goes by and he calls me up. Martin says, Ron, you got to come get this little bugger. He wants his freedom and I want it for him too. He says, he says, you ever seen a kid in a high chair? Just grab a bowl of food and just dump it in his mouth. He says, that's how that cub eats. He says, I can't keep that cub fed. He says, and I don't have a cage strong enough to keep him. So I had called Randy Cross when I found the, when the orphan cub came to me two weeks earlier. I said, Randy, fix this thing a list. We got a place to take it. He says, he had a sow that he knew in LaGrange that adopted 
would would adopt uh, a cub nut. A lot of a lot of sows won't do that, but he had one that was known for taking in cub. So we took the sow, this little cub, up to uh, this bear's den, at Lagrange. And uh, there was still a little bit of snow on the ground, and uh, she hadn't come out of the den yet. And he had me stay back because he knew the sow. And he walked up, and uh, she was curled up, and her cubs were around her. And and uh, he just spoke to her real softly and dropped the cub in there. And he, he said, all she did was take her her arm, pull that little cub in. He says, I, I knew then that it was going to be okay. And I saw that cub years later, believe it or not. Uh, uh, she was a full-grown adult. So that was that was a lot of fun. Yep, but sometimes these bears get into short places where we don't want them to show up. We don't have a problem here in Maine that they do in other states because we've got a bear hunting season. But when they get into trouble, um, I can remember these guys from Florida, they would drive their bees, honeybees, up to the Maine woods and... Uh, and put, plop these beehives up in the main woods to get raspberry honey. And they'd come into my office and they'd be complaining that the bears are tearing up. I said, well, first of all, have you tried to protect the beehives? Well, what do you mean? I said, we've got to have electric fence around it. I said, we've got a policy. We're not going to help you move that bear. You're moving into their territory with your beehives. And until you demonstrate that you're going to take some preventative measures, we're not we're not obligated to help you. You got to think this out. You look at look at look at it from the bear standpoint. So, okay. So he went. I said, get a marine battery. Those are more powerful. And and then uh, he did. And I never heard from him. But there was a guy in Guilford. He had beehives, and uh, he did go through the effort of putting up electric fence around the hives. And this this big big boar bear. He didn't care about getting getting a little charge of electricity. He wanted that honey. So he came in, and uh, I stopped at Evelyn's. I don't know if you've ever been through Evel Guilford, but back then, Evelyn's Bakery, and I'd get these pale donuts. And sure enough, he uh, he went in, and I, I got him in this culvert trap, and I took him up to Jackman and rolled him into the woods and dumped him off. That bear was back in Guilford in about a month. <laughs> the guys in the office kid me. He said, yeah, he almost beat you back to town. <laughs> so now that bear is trap shy. And I had a hard time getting him. And I said to Charlie Davis, who was a game warden, and Shirley, my neighbor, I knew Charlie was a great guy. I said, Charlie, he, he's not going to go in for those donuts again. I said, we got, you got any suggestions? Yeah, they can't resist lobster shells. Go down to the Wagon Wheel restaurant and ask them to keep the, the spent lobster shells. You know, people discard all these lobster shells. He said, they love lobster shells. So I did. And in the back of that culvert trap is the bait bag. You put the bait bag back here and it's attached to a line and they pull on that and the door drops. So I got them again. This is before 9-11. I drove up through Jackman and to Quebec and then back into Maine <laughs> over near uh, Clayton Lake, and I dropped him off, dropped the bear off there. Oh, so now that I'm retired, I, uh, I, uh, I enjoy going around the state looking at these. Uh, there's something called the old tree, record tree registry. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's really fun to some of these. Most of these trees are, of course, on private land, but a lot of landowners will let you go check out these big old trees that are in the main Forest Service register. Um, these are this this one is up near up near Jack. It's not the it's not the biggest white pine in the state, but still a pretty big pretty big pine. Um, so that's, that's I'm kind of kind of enjoying that, and I'm volunteering um, for the I did some work for the main Department of Marine Resources, the salmon restoration. Some of you know there's a big restoration project going on in the Sandy River. And uh, I was saying at dinner time that the Sandy River probably has the best spawning and rearing habitat of any river. You see, I think personally, and I'm not a fishery biologist, 
I think it's as good or if not better than the Penobscot. And the Penobscot has gotten all the attention, all the money over the years for good reason. There's a big run of Atlantic salmon there, but the Sandy's been overlooked. And it's now beginning to realize that, you know, as a, as a climate warm, the Sandy River, especially from Phillips up, it's all shaded, you know, cool water coming down. And that's what these fish need. So that's where the state is focusing a lot of this restoration effort is on, is on the Sandy River. And uh, I say this is a climate change loser because, you know, this species once existed from basically uh, the Hudson River in, in the United States, Hudson River north and through Maine. And now there's only a handful of rivers in Maine. They're gone from New York. They're gone from Connecticut. They're gone from the Merrimack River. Um, they've disappeared um, for lots of reasons, dams being probably the biggest. But Maine is home to the last wild native salmon runs, and the Sandy River right here is one of the most important rivers left. Great, great, uh, great, great animal. And I say another loser I'm worried about, of course, is eastern brook trout. Maine is the last stronghold of the eastern brook trout. Um, if you look at the brook trout joint venture maps, and there is a website, you can see where the range was for the eastern brook trout up and down the Appalachians, and they've blinked out. That means they've, they're disappearing, and their red dots indicate they're in trouble all up and down the east, eastern Appalachians. Um, but in Maine, we still have pretty good populations of brook trout. But I, I am worried about this because they really need cold water. They, they, they need well oxygenated cold water. And they are incredibly handsome fish. And if they disappear, you know, a lot of the traditional fishing lodges that depend on Eastern Brook Trout. I was, I was at Pierce Pond Camp last week. Uh, maybe some of you have been to Cobb's Camp on Pierce Pond. You know, renowned Brook Trout fishery. Um, this, and I've, this picture was taken on um, Kennebago River. Greg and I were fishing that a few years ago. Um, beautiful body of water, beautiful brook trout waters. Um, but we've gotten, you know, illegal introductions of bass in some of the places, the watersheds where brook trout thrive. And I, I grew up in the Belgrade Lakes area. And great pond in the Belgrade when I was a kid. You know, it was fabulous trout and salmon and fishery. Now it's northern pike, you know. I mean, and 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 well, bass. It just it's it sick it sickens me really, and now I'm seeing it in the Upper Kennebec Basin that uh, bass have just taken over what was great. So these poor trout have got to compete with that, and they can't. They can't really can't. Um, another winter, believe it or not, we've got great white sharks off the coast of Maine. They're um, increasing in numbers in part because we have a really big seal population, harbor seals and, and gray seals. And uh, I did a piece, it's in the book, about uh, these uh, lobstermen in, uh, near Eastport in Lubeck. Um, guy caught a, he what? He's, he's just frightened to death. He pulled up this, his lobster pots sort of tangled and he, he didn't know what, he couldn't get it to come up. And he lifted it up, and there, there were, he's got a, a great white shark tangled up in a in his lobster ropes. But there's a piece in there about that how 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 frightened he was of that. So the, as the water's warm, the Gulf of Maine is warming up as fast as any body of water in the world, marine water in the world. And we're starting to see you know great whites moving up here. You know, sadly, I think it was a few years ago we had somebody get killed by a great white down by uh, Bailey's Island. But I've met an awful lot of wonderful people. It isn't just, I've had a great career, of course, um, being a wildlife biologist in Maine. I've worked from Wells, Estuan Reserve, all the way up to Allagash and Lubeck and, and west to Moosehead and, and uh, the Moose River. I mean, I just, just, it was a dream, dream year, but I've, dream job, but I've, I really met some wonderful people. And probably on, high on that list was Roy Gardner in Allagash, in the, the Gardner house. Roy, uh, I just heard, learned that he was, he's, he's in a nursing home in Fort Kent, but it's been in his family since 1885. 
you know, uh, Roy's done every job you can think of in Allagash. And he started working in the logging industry when, when he was uh, 16. So that had been 1943. And all these terminologies like head chopper, uh, they don't exist anymore because everything's mechanized. But the head chopper was the guy that went ahead of the, the uh, two-man crosscut team and he'd chop a notch in the tree and then they'd follow him and they said, okay, this is the tree we're supposed to cut down. And behind that would be the grip tenders that would knock off the limbs and then cut off the top. Then the yard tender would come. Um, you know, teamsters would come, excuse me, the horses, and they would pull it out to the yard tender. And they were usually right, right the yards right next to the river because they floated them down the river into St. John. And long logs, 32 foot logs, short logs, the cook and the cookie, I met, I, I found that to be true up at Clayton Lake, you know, because it was a uh, French Canadian cook and the cookie, the assistant. And then Roy was telling me, you know, the bateau. I mean, he, he remembers, you know, time when there were the bateaus were going up and down the river to unplug the log jams on the St. John. Just so there's a story in there about Ray, Roy uh, Gardner in the book about his life. And, uh, I'm just so grateful that I got a chance to meet him and talk to him. I've known him since 1978 because he was involved in the Dickey Lincoln Project, and I was too, peripherally. And my publisher wanted me to write, he, he, he wanted the piece about Bill, Hill, Bill Hall, who was the, the hermit. And he enjoyed the story so much, he put him on the cover. You know, I mean, he, well, I'm, I'm not on the cover, but he wanted the name Hermit Bill on the cover, just to a main character, put it, let's put it that way. You know, he just, he dragged his, he dragged his clothes behind his canoe to wash them. He had a little string and he would paddle around the lake. And uh, I found his obituary and, uh, and his obituary said he had a great sense of humor. And I gathered that because my, my mother's cousin knew him quite well. Her father ran a logging camp at Spencer Lake right near this guy. He said he was he was one of a kind, you know, just really unique individual. Um, so there's a story in there about him. Me, I I you know retired and volunteering, and I love splitting wood. That's a great joy. And uh, I'm a caretaker of a cabin up near Jackman. Uh, the owners live in Connecticut, and they get up maybe four or five weekends a year. And in, in return for me being taking care of the maintenance of the place, I get I got a place to to use year round when they're not there. And I love it. It's just it's a it's a great spot. And you know this is right up front of the cabin. I get to I got a beautiful view of sunrise. Just go out there in the morning. It's quiet, watch sunrise, and then the cabin is right over here on the right on that point there, and I, the sun sets. So um, that's it. So that's my career in a in a nutshell. Yeah, I'd be uh we got about a half an hour, I think, or so. So if you want feel free to ask some questions. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. I hope I didn't talk too long. Yeah. Um the one that um moved and the bridge to it. Why is it that only the most thing can be affected? Why? Yeah, that's no. This is you know some right. There's some species. Some ticks are species specific, and this one happens to be uh, specific to moose. And we hope it stays that way. And as far as we know, they don't transmit a disease like deer ticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you've got dog ticks, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. other ticks that can can jump from uh, host to host. But as far as we know, a moose tick is. I mean, I I had all those hundreds of moose tick larvae on me, but they never they never got bedded. I drove from Holton all the way home, and then never was bitten. And uh, I just when I got home, I threw everything in all my clothes in the in the washing machine, washed them, and that was that. But yeah, but yeah, they they seem to be really specific to to moose. I mean, they've always had them, but it just seems like now they the they're played with. Well. Yeah. I mean, in some states, it's even worse. I mean, New Hampshire is really bad. Vermont, they're worse because the winters are shorter. Minnesota has a real problem. I mean, in fact, they stopped their season, hunting season, for quite a few years. 
I think I just reopened it. Mostly. But very limited. And I don't I don't quibble with the state's plan. I think I think you know the plan to you know try to reduce the moose population. And I and the, and the thinking is well we'll we still hunt them recreationally, but I think they're, they're worried, the thinking is you know maybe we can reduce help reduce the ticks that way you know, so they won't be quite as prolific. I don't I don't know the rationale because I, I haven't I've retired in 2010, but I, I'm not opposed to definitely not opposed to hunting moose. I think. You know, they're great to eat. I, I hunted moose myself. But I like seeing them too. And I like getting a kick out of seeing people get pictures of them. Anybody else? Questions? Don't be bashful. Yes. Yeah, how can you get people like, um, I don't have any cash to you. I'll, I'll just write you my address and I trust you to send me a check. Okay. Yeah. No one's ever, I mean, I've done it quite a bit, and no one's ever. Stiff me, and if they do, that's on them. That's all I care about. Anybody else? So, is the farm you grew where your grandparents on Elm Street? Nope, that was Chicken Street when I was a kid. It was Chicken Street then? Yep. Was it still there? It's Elm Street now. Uh, they were on the Sandy River Road, which is now called Main Street. Okay. As you go down Route 2 towards Menard Walk, it veers off to the left. And it was down there past Herman Redlowski. I don't know if that rings a bell. Herman Redlowski's farm was on the left. And then uh, my grandparents' farm was on the right. And then there was the turkey farm down there on the left. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it's a big, it's a big turkey farm there now. Yeah. But that's that's where my grandparents farm. Yeah. But I used to remember uh, there was a piece in there about uh, Albert and Ralph True. They they lived on. Are you from Mercer? No. No. Yeah, they, Okay. Yeah, they, they lived on what we call Chicken Street. But I think the realtors said, you know, we got to change the name of the street. <laughs> Elm Street. I think mean, growing up with Smithfield, where the boat launch was, it was called the Bog Road. And now North Shore Drive. <laughs> Can't sell a house on the Bog Road, so we'll call it. I mean, this is a true story. The real estate agent said, we're going to change it over to uh, North Shore Drive. Makes it sound more true. I spell Bob. Yes. I was reading somewhere that I think it was somewhere in Virginia. You, you uh, had a meeting with Bob Wagner. Yes. Couple, I met him a couple times. Couple. Yeah. Character. I did. Did you meet him? <laughs> Where'd you meet him? I met him with Walter. Yep. Uh, when I was. In Red River Township, Gary Call. Yeah, Gary. Oh, sure. I knew Gary very well. You did. So you know Greg Drummond, then, if you work for Gary. Yeah. Oh, it's all great. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah. He, exactly. He went down to the bank. Greg and I were at Pierce Farm last week. Of course, Andy's got it now. But yeah. So, yeah. Am I exaggerating in the book or not? Bob was, he was Karen. He's not being his own yeah, yeah, so he used to be Barry Store. I mean, he was like a fixture in Barry Store. I, I, I he was like the breeding committee. He's going in the wall, he's in the rocking chair right there. Uh, that's a friend of mine, Dr. Joseph Marston. You heard of him. He had a cabin on Spencer Lake. He, uh, and uh, he always said to me, he said, I want to meet Bob Webb. You got you and your brother met him. He said, I want to meet him. So I said, Well, he's great in the berries. We'll stop, we'll stop in. So we're going to get that big wooden rocking chair. We're going and he says, uh, Bob, I says, uh, you don't remember me, but uh, I'm Ron Joseph. He says, were you one of those crazy college kids that came in here one winter? He says, I said, well, I want you to meet Dr. Marshall. I said, he's got the cabins on Spencer Lake. He says, oh, I've always wanted to meet you. He says, I got a skipper behind your house in your camp. If you have, if you don't know Bob White, you can't see Dead River Rough. That's your other, that's your other assignment tonight. North of the CPO line, and then Google Dead River Rough Cut video. It's rough, but I show you it's it's class. It's a main. I showed it to a friend of mine at the University of Maine. He's a new professor. When I was on campus, he said. If my wife had seen this film before we came to Maine, she never would have come. <laughs> yeah, Dead River Rough Cut. Yeah, Bob Wall. 
Yeah, I first met Bob Wagner. Yes. When was the first Arab oil embargo? 72, 73? I was at the University of Hampshire and they closed because oil was hard to get, you know, and expensive. So they sent us home. And my brother was a cold. He got out of school. And yeah, we're home for several weeks and we're going to do it. So I worked in the woods for a week with Greg Drummond, cutting the pulp wood. He's never worked so hard in my life <laughs> and got paid so little. And then another week, uh, Dr. Marsh had two snowmobiles. We took a couple of friends and we went into his cabin. And I can remember it was it was uh, 39 below. And my parents said, you're not going tonight to study 39 below. And you know, one okay, well, I wanted that like 30 below the next. So they had a 67 Jeepster and put a Dr. Marshall with snowmobiles. And we went up to Pound Pond and unloaded. This is before snowmobiling was even big. There was no trails. So we had to leapfrog each other to get in it because we get bogged down going on the high track. Go as far as we could and then bogged down. And the other one go, mm and then go in front of it, and then we push it and get it. Anyway, we ended up at the POW camp, prison, and we saw heat smoke coming out of one of the chimneys at the, the, the war camp. Whoa. Knocked on the door. Everybody there. Jeez, this is nice and warm. And we'll get it get warm for a few. We go in there, so we get warm, and then we started heading over to Spencer Lake and Dr. Monsters, and here comes Bob Wack, you know. He had it. He was pulling, he had an old snowmobile, loud as anything, and he had a sled full of beaver on it. And he certainly come back with it because uh, he was squatting in one of the POWs. And we went back, and uh, he said, You guys are going to freeze now. And the marshals can't, it's going to be too cold. Really, you should send them out here. And Walter was there. He said he hadn't seen Walter since first. And, and I remember this happened, happened twice with Bob. He, he had these pet candles that they could feed him. The cabin was so hot, he opened up the window and he put these biscuits on the windowsill and all these candles of jays just on that. It was, it was really magical. And then later on, I had him when he couldn't get the box back. Yeah, yeah he was, God bless him. You know, he, was, he, was, he was really. Yeah. So, so there there was, there was a video list if you can watch it. The language is a little the language is a little rough, but it's not very good. I love it. Anybody else? Yes. We just open up. <laughs> I did that. I put a new stove in it just recently. But there's gas all through that lake with Spencer Lake. Oh, too bad. We think we know who did it, but can't prove it. Too late now. Well, thank you very much. I guess if anyone else has questions or come <laughs> well, on up. I got some books here if anybody wants a book. Um, I don't take a credit card, so twenty dollars says what I have taxes. I mean twenty will cover the tax. Thank you.